Today I am very, very excited because I am in Cordelia Williamsburg. And today I'm cooking at the Peyton Randolph's kitchen. What's exciting about it is also that I have help, believe it or not. In any kitchen that you form, it's always difficult, but guess who I find? An almost countryman of mine, Barbara, who is the cook here. We have a very ambitious menu today, Barbara, so I'm so glad that I have you here because without you, I might be sweating. Now I'm very cool and relaxed. Just kidding. Today in A Taste of History, we make a chicken vermicelli soup, veal fricassee with curried rice pilaf, and a poached pear in Madeira with sabayon. Walter, it sounds wonderful. Thanks, Barbara. It's all to give you a taste of history. Today's episode is dedicated to Peyton Randolph, who was the president of the First and Second Continental Congress. So without further ado, Barbara, are you ready for the talent, the task at hand? I certainly am. Look at this beautiful chicken we have here. So if you want to do me a favor and yeah. put this fellow in his water. Now, Barbara, I have a whole bunch of uh, wood vegetables and stuff that I used from before the trimmings. Anything kind of that's, uh, that's available that you have laying around fits right in there. There's really no... Here we go. Some and of course, you've got some nice carrots from the garden. Right here, from your garden, yeah. Good. yeah. A little bit of, I like a little sprig of thyme in it, not much more than that. And a bay leaf in there. And if you will throw this into the chicken. I certainly can. Thank you. Okay, I'm just going to put them in now, Walter. Yeah, okay? perfect. Yeah, and just leave it in there. And I'm going to push the crane closer yeah. so that they boil. Perfect. I've already made the pasta dough, which is real simple, and everybody knows all purpose flour, eggs, a little bit of oil. Mine, I put no water in at all. It's just the, the, the liquid of the egg binds us. Would you like me to roll it for uh, you? Exactly. That's what Certainly. I was thinking about. While you roll, I cut the other ones I already pre-made. How is that? Sure. Here you go. No problem. I'm using a white flour, but not a bleached flour, because in this time period, we obviously didn't have bleached flour. Which makes it perfect. Now, in the recipe of 1745, it says, if you work next to a fireplace, don't worry about it. The fire will dry it in a very short time. And the, ba the basic thing is you want to make it just a really fine cut. And then what we'll do is I'm going to get the chicken over that I, we have in the other pot and let you take out the chicken and take the meat off the bone because obviously you want to pull it nicely. Now, a lot of people tell you it seems an awful lot of trouble for a chicken soup. But believe it, once they taste the chicken soup like that, you will never go back to another one. Surely not opening a tin, that's for sure. <laughs> well, you know, we get that all the time in the kitchen. People are surprised when we tell them how wonderful the 18th century food actually is in this kitchen and in the palace kitchen. Absolutely, and I witnessed it yesterday. You have so much heart in the food, which I really like, you know, it makes it spectacular. You want to get the, uh, the chicken over for us in the one pot? Here we go. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. And let's strain the stock right in here. This smells absolutely... <laughs> well, how can you go on? All these beautiful root vegetables we put into it. All the goodness in there is spectacular. It doesn't get much better than that. At the 18th century, chickens were reserved to lay eggs. It was their primary function. Eggs for baking, eggs for desserts, eggs for cooking, all kinds of things. Especially a lot of the flans, the creme brulees, all the things that the upper echelon would love to dine on in the 18th century. But once the chicken was not useful to lay eggs anymore, stewing pot came next. So all the chickens, which have obviously much more flavor, would be then cooked like we are doing today on the show. Uh, the interesting thing also is if they have a lot of fat in the inner cavity, the fat would be taken out and rendered down for chicken schmaltz to use a variety of different dishes. The soup today would have been all the chicken with much more flavor. The wood vegetables are perfect, as you see, and what a flavor your lot has. I mean, take a look at that. Now we're going to do, we put the chicken in here. Chicken. Either way, chicken first and then the stock, so we know how much okay. room well, we have. Remember, yeah. I've kept the head Hold, and the feet exactly for you. Exactly as you have flavor. it. Yeah. Put the stock on top. All the way, yep, perfect. Now we're gonna put this little bag on the fire. Okay, well I'm putting the lid on this now, okay, put the coals perfect. underneath. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the vermicelli right into 
the boiling water. And then, Bob, you want to put this back under the highest heat you can give me. A couple of minutes time. Our chicken vermicelli soup is ready just to be assembled into a beautiful, today obviously, a soup terrine from the 18th century, which we don't get often the pleasure to use. All the transcripts and the, the manifest of Thomas Jefferson and Monticello, we saw many entries of chicken vermicelli soup, which we assume would have been the same thing. Speaking of yes. that, would you reach the soup over for me? Certainly. Can. While you get the soup, I'll reach the vermicelli. Now the big thing I want you to do is taste it for salt and pepper, because the only thing we haven't done yet. I'll be tasting too a little bit. Let me see. Oh, God. That tastes good even without salt and pepper in. Good, isn't the word for that? That is fantastic. I'm just going to put a bit more pepper please, in. Please, please, please. I'm going to get the vermicelli right now. You want to ladle this in here for me? And then we'll stop it off with a stock. Just getting the, the vermicelli out of the, the pot. Now, if you would do this in stages, then you let this get cold. You can shock it in cold water. Perfect. That's fine. Let me put the rest of it in there. I mean, if that's not fit for a king, then I don't know. Well, it's certainly <laughs> fit for Peyton Randolph. Oh, well, sure. There we are in this kitchen. And basically, there we are. That's all I would do. Then I have some parsley chopped, a little bit of parsley. And the only thing I do sometimes, which I like, which makes it a little bit unique, not for extra flavor, just do a couple of spring onions or green onions, quick chop right on top, a little bit, like so, put it on top there, and that's how it would be served. I'm sure Peyton Randolph would approve of this recipe, and the flavor is just spectacular. I mean, it's like, it's just too difficult to describe how good it is. All the different goodness of the chicken, the, the wood vegetable, the vermicelli, it's just spectacular. I'm sure it would have been served many times here. Well, you've got spring onions yeah. on there right now, but it would depend on seasonality in this time period, whether you have them on or not, gotcha. because we do do a lot of seasonality. Beautiful. So, But we're lucky in Virginia, we do have vegetables growing in know. our ground all the way through until the February. Colonial Williamsburg, which sprouted up next to the original Jamestown settlement in Virginia, is said to be the site of the start and the end of the American Revolution. It was here where colonists, angered by the stamp taxes levied by the British Crown, led early revolts. And toward the war's end, it was near here, at Yorktown, where British troops surrendered. Colonial Williamsburg is the most uh, intact revolutionary capital in the United States. This town has the greatest number of original 18th century structures, 88 of them, and still has the original uh, street plan. So it was possible to reconstruct the revolutionary capital of, of Virginia. With the House of Burgesses meeting here, Colonial Williamsburg was destined to become the thriving capital of the new country. But Britain's grand plans were thwarted by some of the very residents of this important area. Right here, some of the most important principles underpinning the new republic, and the new government, uh, were worked out in the General Assembly. So this is a, is a very important place. It's perhaps a, a history that's less well understood by most Americans than the history of, say, Boston or, or Philadelphia. But Virginia really uh, played a key role. All right, let me tell you a few things about Ville Fricasse. <laughs> Mother Washington's favorite. And uh, obviously, it's intimidating when you see a big breast like that, breast of Ville, it is because this is very difficult to see in the store that size. But for the recipe and being true to the recipe, I wanted to make sure I show the, uh, the viewer exactly how it's done. All you want to do is cut the veal breast, but right here, because after that, you'd have to use your cleaver to chop it down. We want to, we want to have to do that. So I want to go and just cut through it. Now, there's a couple of things you can do. You can take the rib and uh, you can just, uh, what do you call it, uh, French it, but you don't need it because this rib would obviously be used for great stock. Now, all you want to do, you want to, I'll give this to you in a moment. You're going to put this right behind you in the 
pot that's on the fire and a rolling boil. Now, could you not get a veal breast? Could you substitute it? I guess you could substitute it with like a, a shoulder. Would not yeah. be bad. So you want to do this in the pot but for you've me? you've also got to realize in this time period, we're not afraid of our fats, Walter. We use a lot of yep, fats. Yep. Throw it in the pot. And there it goes, got it? All right. What we're going to do is put some bay leaf in there. An onion. The, the cloth becomes like a nail, which actually what it means. <laughs> a cloth, and then stick it right in there. The interesting thing I found with this particular recipe that really intrigued me when I first researched and made it a bunch of times to get it right, was that it includes uh, small, tiny meatballs made with veal. And I'm saying to myself, why is that? Most likely, I think it has some frugality. Because I think what you have a lot of scraps and stuff that don't look very pretty for the uh, fricassee. So you make some really tiny uh, veal balls like you would do for like an Italian wedding soup. And this was added into it. So if you want to do me a couple of those together really quick. And those ones can two ways. You can poach them on the side or you can throw them right in when the other veal is almost done. Well, they're so small, Walter, that they won't. They won't take no time at all. No. So we'll do a few of those and then we add it in the back to the veal fricassee that's under fire. So here we go. That's it. Let's put them in the back. I'll just bring it out, just yep. touch them. That's good for the yep. crane. Yep. All right. There we go. Let so me just put that back on the fire for you. Look at that. Beautiful oysters. Open me a few of those. I already pre shocked a few of them. For this dish, I would use butter. I wouldn't use schmaltz. And it's going to go really, really, really quick. Put it in here. Well, look at that. Listen to that sizzle straight away. Because there's so much heat there. Yeah. Perfect. OK. Now, all we're going to do is sweat the, no color, no color at all. Okay. Not at all. Just make it translucent. In the meantime, let me bring the wheel up to the, to the table. Look how beautiful is that. Absolutely beautiful. Now, all we got to do is take the oysters, throw it right into your, uh, to your pan. Okay. Soon as it gets to a little boil, we push it to the side because we want to make sure that the oyster doesn't get hard. Now you can give me some of the other little wheel bolts that we pre-blanched already. An effort to speed up. These are very hot. Yep. Perfect. Here we go. I'm going to add the wheel bolts right into the fricassee. Oh, that smells absolutely Ooh. wonderful. Okay, here we go. You can just lose that for me. And the liaison that I'm putting in here right now is Beaumarnier, which is basically butter and flour, the exact ratio. Here, what you can do, you add it slowly, as you see me doing it here, to your uh, fricassee or to any kind of stew you make, but you can stop whenever you feel that the sauce has the, has the right thickness that you want. So in other words, you can really make sure in this particular scenario that you don't uh, over, over thicken your, uh, your stacks. I'm going to bring this back on the fire for a little bit. In like literally minutes, I'll be ready to serve up this fantastic fricassee. The oysters are absolutely perfect. We're going to just push it off to the side. The stew fit for a king, or in this particular scenario, for Peyton Randolph. Meat uh, means wealth, and wealth means hospitality, Walter, in this oh. time period. Mm, so the more meat you put yeah. on a course, the more wealthier you are. Most of us are poor, free, black or white, and we eat stew, stew, stew. <laughs> Is that corn, meat, veggies, veggies, corn, meat, corn, corn, corn? Amazing. You want to reach me the, the heavy cream right over there? Now, you pour some in here, like a little bit more than a half cup. That's good. Okay, I'm now. generous. Now comes the most important part. Taste it under lemon for me quick. See if the acidity is right, because it has to have a certain amount of tang. Check on the salt and check on the pepper. It needs a little seasoning. Go ahead. Oh, it's good though. It's good. It's excellent. Oh. Oh yeah, it's good. It's like uh, just the way the doctor. It's like gold. So now you want to stir it in. It will not go back on the fire, because right. if you put it back on the fire now, you have what? Scrambled eggs. 
So you don't want to do that. We can actually feel it thickening. Oh yeah, right away. Well, right away. Some parsley in here. I mean, look at that. Or oh, the oysters, let's come right here. Yep. It's just how I want them. You don't want to overcook them. It's almost like a little blanch, just like that. Perfect. We all have reference in our cookbooks that oysters are as large as dinner plates. That's, look at that. That's beautiful. Done. That is gorgeous. These days, coffee is everywhere. We take it for granted. It's on every street corner. Let's see how 18th century coffee was brewed here at Colonial Williamsburg. R. Charleston's Coffee House is a recreation of an authentic 18th century meeting place where Williamsburg elite could meet and enjoy a freshly roasted coffee. I'm here with Frank, who is the big chief here at Foodways at Williamsburg, and he's going to show me a few things about roasting coffee the 18th century way. So, Frank, Tell me what we're doing now. We're uh, beginning to roast the beans now, Walter. This is our coffee roaster. Uh, you can see here, uh, it's basically just a cylinder on a pole. And then that uh, fits into the hook here on the uh, swing arm and allows us to set that right over the, the flame to get a good heat for our beans. The, the one difficult thing about this is, is gauging the temperature and checking. And that's why every now and then you have to take it off the fire, open it up and, and look at it. And you can tell by the amount of smoke coming out uh, and the color of the beans what's going on. We're not done at all at this point. Uh, so it goes back on the fire. How much time does it take from the initial start of the roasting until you actually enjoy it? It's probably going to be anywhere from a half hour to an hour, depending on the heat of the fire and, and the beans as they're roasting. Then they have to cool. You also to have a, a little bit of chafe that you need to get out of mm -hmm. them and winnow them. We would simply pour these beans into the mortar and pestle and crush them up. This can take a while. In fact, kids are, are your big labor source 200 years ago. Everybody thinks of slavery here in Virginia, but most Virginians could not afford to own a slave. Remember, kids 200 years ago are not in school. They're not laying around playing Nintendo. They're working. Now we simply get some hot water out of our boiler over here. It's even a while now. It's ready to go here. No, that's a cup of coffee. Yes, it is. Very good. And you know, Walter, it wasn't just about getting coffee here. It's also about the social interaction that's going on here. This building is right next to the Capitol. So those gentlemen who are meeting in the House of Burgesses and the Governor's Council at the Capitol are coming here after their political meetings. This is also the Merchants' Exchange. The price of tobacco is set in this room, as well as other commodities. It hasn't really changed. A lot of those no, coffee no. places, people, except no laptops here and a little thing. Exactly. <laughs> no Wi-Fi. What kind of bill of fare would I have had besides coffee here, what do you think? Well, it's good evidence that this is the highest clientele coffee house around. And in fact, uh, the clientele here being those Burgesses and the other very important Virginians, the food is to match that. Speaking of food, let's get back to Peyton Randolph's kitchen to do some cooking. I adore rice pilaf, but today we make an even a special rice pilaf that is beyond belief because it uses curry and root vegetables. And also, instead of oil or butter, I'm using today the famous Williamsburg lard, or I call it schmaltz. What you want to do, you want to have a pan that is hot, and I mean hot. We're going to put the rice into the pan. Now, Bob, my assistant, is going to put it on the fire for me, and we're going to cook the rice just a little bit, not much. While, while she's doing that, I'm just taking quick an onion and I have already the other root vegetable cut up. So what you want to do, you want to glaze the rice to give us the extra crispness. I have the garlic already minced and now you get the pleasure of putting all the root vegetables into it. Carrot, parsnip, a little bit of mushroom celery, and rutabago. You call them whatever you call them in England, you told me. Curry powder goes in this very second, and I get a lot of questions about curry powder all the time. Curry, curry, was curry available? 
the absolute answer is yes. The English Empire bought curry all over the world. Actually, they're solely responsible for it. And it came into the port of Philadelphia from the West Indies, but also made it in, obviously, to Williamsburg and to Monticello and Mount Vernon. And right here at uh, Williamsburg, they have much documentation of curry in your books that I read. So oh, yeah. everybody has it. So basically, all I've done here is what you see me do. Chicken stock, white wine, even water would work. Add it into it. Put it on the fire for me, and then we'll put a lid on it. Yeah. We let it cook. Now, the difference on this particular one I make, once that is absorbed, the liquid in there, and it gets a little dry, I'm going to put a little white wine into it. It gets a unique little flavor, you know, as we cook it later. Now we're going to get started on the dessert. The beauty of the 18th century, obviously, they harvested and put root cellars, but the pears like that wouldn't necessarily have made it into the kitchen, and not even in Peyton's kitchen, um, trust me. The beauty of this recipe that I'm making is that the, the pears and apples that are stored in the root cellar would shrivel up. Whether you make them into cobblers or into strudel or you poach it. Because when you poach it, you, you actually you peel the pear and then you put it in the poaching liquid, whatever liquid might be. Well, so I peel the pear. Would you do me a favor and put eight, eight egg yolks in your pan? I certainly can. All right. I peel the pear. Very simple, very easy, nothing to it. All you got to do is pe poach peel the pear and then any portion liquid you like. There's really, again, no right or wrong. What goes in it, let me show you quick here. I put in mine cinnamon, I put star on this, a little bit of vanilla, and a little bit of clove. That's all I put in there. Very simple. Now, to serve it, and to serve it nicely, would you give me the, the, the boil over? Sure can. Uh-huh. I'll have egg yolks. Yeah. And I have sugar, egg yolk and sugar. Put me a pinch of cinnamon in there, if you will. Yep. So now you want to just get this up here and get it on a good, good stiff. So now I'll just take that. It's ready for me, for my taste. And I just put it in the bottom of the, bottom of the plate here. And then. And you're going to bring your uh, whisk up only because it's so warm by the fire. Oh, that, that looks gorgeous. Isn't it? fit for a king or for Pedro Randolph. It would even be fit for a royal governor. <laughs> How's that? And, sim and how simple is that for a nice, refreshing, refreshing dessert? So now we got to do bring all of our dishes back and really feast on our creation. Frank, perfect timing. How did you know? <laughs> I can smell. Yeah, you can smell. We're just finishing the meal. We're doing the last little thing is the curried rice pilaf that I'm just uh, putting on the plate. Look at how gorgeous it is cooked with the root vegetables of the 18th century and cooked instead of oil or butter in uh, lard or schmaltz as we call it. And look at that. So we have obviously the rice which is just served up, the veal fricasse with the tiny veal meatballs and the oysters poached in white wine with shallots. We obviously have the pièce de résistance, our chicken vermicelli soup. And we finished all of it, a porch pear in Madeira. So what do you think about that? Pain Randolph would have liked it? Wonderful. I'm sure Mr. <laughs> Randolph would be very happy. All right, well, let, do me a, a favor and let me know what you think about my cuisine. I'll try one of my rice right now. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Mm. It's been a great pleasure on our part to have you come and see us. Well, the pleasure has been all mine. And thanks to uh, your assistant, Barbara, here, the cook at the Peyton Randolph uh, kitchen. Nothing could have been better. Yeah, really beautiful. appreciate it. And I want to really thank you for opening your, your cuisine and your hearts. <laughs> Thank you. That's what Virginia hospitality is all about. That's what it's a Virginia's for lovers, isn't it? That's right. Okay. <laughs>